Well, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Accurate Robotics 3D Vision, an educational webinar sponsored by Universal Robotics and Yasukawa Motoman Robotics. My name is Jeff, and I'll be your host for today's event, which means I'll be in the background answering any general or technical questions that come through on the chat area. You see that on the right-hand side of the screen. During the, today's call, we are very interested in the questions that you have about our uh, presentation, so you can place those questions in the, the Q&A panel that you see in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Just type your question in a smaller rectangular square and simply hit send. Today, I'm very pr uh, privileged to introduce you to our two presenters. Uh, our first presenter will be Hob Lebanon, Director of Marketing of Universal Robotics, and Eric Nieves, uh, Nieves Tech uh, Technology Director of Yaskawa Motorman Robotics. During our call today, we'll go in depth into the presentation as well as being able to answer your questions. So we have two of our panelists that will be uh, answering those questions as we go. and at the end of today's conversation. Now, this event is being recorded, and we'll send a link out to you after this event so you can watch it in its entirety. And without further ado, it is my extreme privilege to turn the call over to Hob to get our presentation started. So, Hob, the call is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, and welcome, everybody, uh, whether it be uh, morning, afternoon, or evening for you. Uh, so, to kind of set the cadence, we will finish on time in an hour from now. Uh, a couple of the topics we want to go through, we want to introduce 3D vision and robotic 3D vision and some of the uh, kind of the geometry behind that. We're going to address uh, the different kinds of robotic vision, 2D, 2.5D, and 3D, and we'll then dive into what are the elements of accuracy for robotic 3D vision. So as you're designing a system, these are things you need to keep in uh, to, uh to do that. And then finally, uh, some things to consider when you're actually choosing a 3D vision system. And then about the last 10 minutes, we'll kick it over to Aditya and Greg, where uh, they will handle questions that you submit. So here we go. Uh, robotic 3D vision, uh, what we're not going to talk about, it's very difficult to jam all of the pertinent uh, technical information you need in one hour. So we made some choices. We're not talking about 3D mosaic. We're not talking about depth from focusing capability. We won't be talking about time of flight or laser um, vision analysis tools. But what we are going to zero in on is robotic vision for part inspection and vision guidance. Vision guidance being where we are giving you six degrees of freedom of information that you can then drive a robot to. Um, and uh, please note that 3D accuracy for robotic vision requires both intrinsic camera calibration and hand-eye, or the robot's hand to the camera's eye calibration. So let's talk for a minute about the difference between repeatability and accuracy. Repeatability is very important for a robot that's going to continue to go to the same point. For instance, off the corner of a part, it's going to come in and find the centroid uh, or of, a, of a particular drill point or machined part, and it can repeat finding that point going. When you get into random behavior, whether it be random box detail, part picking, or you have a pile of parts in a bin, you need there. there is no ability, so it gets more to knowing your accuracy, and that's what we're going to zero in into today. So let's talk for a minute, set a few basics around intrinsic camera calibration. So you see the little drawing here. I've set up an XYZ uh, coordinate system. We'll be referring to this throughout the talk. Z is the depth. X and Y is uh, kind of your normal engineering uh, orthogonal point of view. Um, as you look onward, it's the area Y up, X left and right. So in a normal intrinsic cali camera calibration, you'd be uh, collecting camera sensor information, you'd be making sure you have a full uh, uh, field of view, and then typically you'd be running a fiducial by, which is like a checkerboard or a pattern, typically taking 15 varying images of that in various skew and angles and recording that data and then adjusting, and we'll talk a little more about that. And you need to remember, even what I've shown here, you have three coordinate systems. You have the image, you have the camera lens, and you have the object of interest. And so what happens...
happens during calibration is the Y direction, it removes the differences between uh, different images, and that's called image rectification, so that the Ys are aligned between uh, different views. Obviously, when you have multiple cameras, which is what you're interested in, we then compute disparity and distance, and we'll talk about that. And then we align the images on a common plane. Okay. So let's talk about it. I'm sorry this slide is fairly dense, but this is a very uh, key slide to help explain uh, 3D vision and 3D accuracy because it kind of sets the stage for where we're going and then the difference between vision and robotic vision. 3D vision is really stereo vision, so two views that have depth perception, or in our case, Z, that results from a shift from left to right or a delta X. You can do this um, for yourself by just closing one eye and gazing at a point far away and then changing and closing the other eye, and you'll notice that it shifts from left to right. As you get closer to a, a closer object, that shift becomes greater. It's that delta X that helps you estimate the Y or the depth. Okay? So that's basically um, what we're doing here. Robotic vision then adds to that um, both real-time information, <coughs> excuse me, around position, X, Y, Z, and the pose or the orientation, the rotation around X, the rotation around Y, and the rotation around Z, so you can find a specific centroid of a part of interest. And then that interacts um, with the tool or the gripper or whatever with the robot. You send that information to the servoing software. And, and please be aware that the tool you would choose affects the vision requirements. So, for instance, a vacuum or certain grippers, you, you only need to be about uh, 2 to 3 millimeter accuracy. Others, you need to be much more precise. So, I mentioned about intrinsic camera calibration. Then you add to that for robotic vision, hand-eye calibration. Hand-eye, you can see this drawing here. I've indicated the different uh, coordinate systems. Hand is referring to the robot tool, and eye is referring to the camera. So you calibrate the cameras first, and then you need to calibrate uh, between the two of them. And what you're doing is you're doing a transformation of that information across coordinate systems. And once you've done that, you then have the results necessary to do either vision guidance or park inspection. Okay, so that's kind of an introduction to robotic vision how it differs from standard 3D vision. And now we want to talk about types. As, as you can see from this uh, particular, whoops, sorry. Um, as you can see, we have uh, three different models here, 2D, 2.5D, and 3D. You'll note in 2D, we have a single camera, and the information that you get from that single camera is you get an X and Y reading, not depth, and you get the rotation around Z. It's a, it's a rotational thing. For 2.5D, you have a single camera, and typically what you'll do is add a time of flight or a laser that will give you the Z. So now what we've done is we've added depth. Okay, 2.5D, if you have a stamped part or you have a constant Z depth or it's a programmable Z depth on a conveyor line or on a lane, lane flat on the surface, you just, uh, you just, two and a half D is, is sufficient to do that because there's no tilt orientation. If you need true 3D, um, what we're adding in this case is we're adding rotation around X and rotation around Y, and the Z can be variable. And so in this case, what you do is you add a second camera, or you can also add a time of flight or laser uh, with that with different methodologies, uh, but that's beyond the scope of, of this particular webinar. So kind of in summary of the types of 3D vision, uh, and by the way, we will put these slides in PDF form out on the Universal Robotics website so you can refer to these. We have a single stationary system, we have a single moving system, and we have a binocular stereo system. And you can see uh, that you can get 2.5 and, and 3D with a variety of options. Uh, no binocular stereo, which is kind of the focus of today, um, uh, requires only one snapshot. There are different methodologies under the hood by different vendors 
whether it be shape matching where you're actually matching the shape of the object or surface match where you're looking for uh, the actual um, by identifying a, uh, a flat planar surface by a skew, you're able to determine its orientation. Okay. Single stationary cam uh, cameras, uh, typically you can use shape-based 3D matching. You can uh, speed it up by zeroing in on a region of interest. You can also use surface-based 3D matching with a single camera. If you have a single camera in multiple positions, uh, obviously it will require multiple images of the same object to get that 3D uh, image. And, and, and so here's an example of a camera mounted on the end. You can snap multiple and establish a 3D vision. And then binocular cameras would not actually be mounted to the robot, um, but it would it would be able to capture the full field of view in a robot operating envelope. Typically, in this case, you could use more standard off-the-shelf uh, cameras, and it allows you to find uh, randomly located objects. Okay. Sorry about that. So let's move into uh, the elements of accuracy. This is a fairly dense slide. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this. For binocular vision, um, the, um, the accuracy is driven by a number of things. So take a look at the diagram off on the left. You will see we have two cameras, and um, that's the camera center, right? camera one, camera two. Uh, I labeled it virtual image because in reality, that would, the image I'm talking about is what's actually on your CCD sensor, actually is behind the camera, uh, but to get it all on the drawing, and um, I put it in front just so you can kind of get an idea of what's going on here. You have the baseline distance between the camera. In most binocular uh, 3D vision systems, it might be somewhere between 100, maybe up to 200 millimeter max between uh, between the two cameras. You'll see the focal length. So this is a pair of cameras. They must be identical in most situations. Okay? And then you'll see the Z object distance off on the far left. That's to your part, to your box, to your object of interest. Okay? And then delta Z is the uh, depth accuracy we were talking about earlier when we were talking about calibration. And so you can see down there I put in big print delta Z equals Z squared times the, uh, times the uh, change in disparity, which we talked about as the delta X between those image shift points, divided by focal length and baseline distance. Now, the kicker in this is that the focal length in this equation is in millimeters, but everybody in the camera world um, uh, they present it as millimeters, but what we actually need is pixels. Sorry, I said in this equation it's in pixels. So to actually calculate accuracy, you can see I put down there um, what you actually need. You need to know the camera resolution, and you need to know the CCD sensor dimensions in order to calculate this. So you actually have to dive fair into quite a bit of detail in order to know your total accuracy. And, and in some cases, industrial cameras, they all list this information. If you're using more off-the-shelf cameras, um, it's very difficult sometimes to get this information. So let's play with this for a minute. So if your baseline distance, if you put your cameras closer together, let's say closer to the 100 millimeter or like the distance of a pair of adult eyes, um, then you get a larger over, uh, overlap field of view between the two. Right, but since uh, baseline decreases, right, then um, you'll see what happens to delta Z. Um, it actually goes up. As you increase the baseline, get them further apart, you get a better triangulation, so your accuracy improves. But then your field of view decreases, so you got to be careful. Okay, you'll notice that accuracy is the result of the square of the distance. Okay, this is uh, very important to note that as your distance increases, um, then it's the square of the, it has the impact to your overall accuracy. 
All right, and then finally, um, you can see the focal length. Let's say you get something set up and you're just not getting uh, what you need. You can increase or decrease your focal length um, for the exact same camera. Just put a different lens on it. We'll improve this. And I'll mention later, um, we actually have a 3D calculator that will help you sort through all this that um, we have on the Universal Robotics website to work through specifics. All right, let's go to the next slide. So the next question a lot of times people ask is around where do you position the cameras? So it depends on whether this is around a flat surface. So here you have a robot work envelope. And uh, you can see a variety of parts there. And so I need to be very clear. I'm not talking about the work cell space that the robot's placed in. It's the actual area that the robot will be operating in where you will need very clear 3D vision. Okay. So you can see that uh, typically a, the first pair of cameras if they, um, would be typically directly above the robot. Um, it may be, depending on the robot dimensions, and all these things can be calculated. Uh, a lot of times they start by putting them in center line, sometimes behind the robot. 150 might be standard. Um, I've seen them, you know, 6 to 800 millimeters behind the, the, the robot itself, as long as it has a clear field of view, in order to get the field of view and the precision you need. The second pair is always orthogonal to the first pair. And uh, typically placed, it's similar with 100, 150, 200 millimeters uh, separating the two. If you have a flat surface, um, we recommend you start uh, with an angle of a roughly 45 degrees because you're wanting to see uh, both the side of the object as well as the top of the object, and then and then adjust from there. And our calculator will help you with that. Okay. The other thing uh, to note is that your parts type has an impact um, to your overall vision system. So if you'll note the two uh, gray boxes uh, down below, irregular on the lower left, note, irregular objects require about 300 pixels by 300 pixels for determining position and pose. Um, and so that's um, when the camera is actually showing on it, the object, the dark blue object in the middle, needs to have roughly, and it depends on the complexity of the object, at least 300 pixels on it um, in X and Y in order to be able to ascertain position and pose. Now, in the other corner, you'll note, however, if it's a rectangular object, it could be a car cardboard box, it could be a rectangular in shape, simple geometry, you can go down in the 200 range fairly easily and get away with that, which means you don't need quite as good of uh, camera optics and so forth. Okay. So that's flat surface. Many a times, um, you might want it for bin picking. So in this case, the robot operating envelope you can see here extends down to the bottom of the bin because you need to be able to see that. And again, you, you have placement. The key difference here, obviously, is your angle. Your starting angle um, will be steeper. This is uh, down from the horizontal because you'll need to be able to see in that bin. So we recommend that you start at about 60 degrees and adjust uh, from that point. The, the number of uh, pixels for whether it's an irregular object or a rectangular object uh, remain the same. So now at this point, um, I've, I've discussed um, some real basics around um, um, accuracy for 3D vision and so forth. I'm going to turn it over to Eric, who's going to talk about uh, servoing and uh, robot accuracy impact. Thanks, Rob. Yes, what we've discussed to date uh, so far has been accuracy related to the vision sensors. But in robotic applications, you have to take into consideration the manipulator itself and how uh, that impacts the overall accuracy of the application. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time here talking about accuracy versus repeatability. These are the two probably most important terms in the language of robotics and the two most easily confused. Um, I'm going to start from the repeatability side. Repeatability is just 
a measure of the robot's memory, not its uh, CPU memory, not its uh, memory for storing information, but its memory in being able to achieve a point it has been at before. Basically, if you taught the robot the position by picking up the teach pendant and driving it in the ordinary fashion, um, the robot's repeatability will be a measure of how close, how precise is it going to come when it tries to achieve that point in subsequent passes. That's the repeatability of the robot. And robots are engineering marvels when it comes to the specification of repeatability. They have a good memory, if you would. On the other hand, uh, any time the robot has to achieve a position that it was not led to, any time it's being commanded to a position, then the repeatability is not the issue. It's the accuracy. Uh, the accuracy in some way can be thought of as a measure of the ability of the robot to read a map and to achieve a location it has never been to before. Um, robot accuracy, uh, clearly, uh, robot accuracy can't be any better than the repeatability. All right? In fact, it is always uh, worse than the repeatability, and it can only, at best, achieve the repeatability of the manipulator. Okay. Uh, I explain it like this. My uh, son, if it's his first day of school and I need to uh, make sure he gets to school, I will walk him down the street to the left, across a block, and then to that corner, and that's where he picks up the bus. And I'll say to him, tomorrow you need to come to this same spot, and uh, uh, he will make it to school the next day because my son has good repeatability. It's memory. If on the first day of school, though, I say to him, okay, I want you to go out, go down uh, west two blocks, cross the street, and go uh, south a block, and that's where you're going to pick up the bus, my son's not going to make it to school because he is not accurate. Well, robotics is the same way. Robots are not as accurate as they are repeatable. And this has big implications to our discussion on vision. Because in vision, you are commanding the robot. All right? You have an external device that's telling the robot where it should go. So the accuracy is affected by a number of uh, considerations, mechanicals and control, etc. Right? But there are well-known uh techniques in our industry for improving the accuracy of a robot to the point that uh, it is not a limiting factor in vision applications. Repeatability, okay, is um, as a rule, the larger the robot, the less um, uh, precise it's going to be. Right? It's a function of the payload, of the reach, and of the velocity, as demonstrated here on this graph. Okay. So you can see the smaller the robot, the better its repeatability. The, uh, and smaller, the smaller the robot, the lighter the payload. So as a rule, the smaller the, the robot and the smaller the working envelope and the less you have angular work that you need to consider, the more accurate you're going to be in the end. So this is just a plot um, uh, where we demonstrate this. You can see we've created an arbitrary metric where you have the payload of the robot that's on the vertical axis, the payload of the robot times its reach times its composite velocity in degree per second. Right? So there are no units to this metric, but it does give you a sense of Big robots with high payload, long reach, and high speed versus those that are smaller. And you can see that the uh, repeatability is much better at the low end. So your accuracy is typically going to be on the order of 3 to 5x your repeatability. Right. 
and the accuracy is not constant over the workspace. Hence, uh, this is why it's important as you look at a 3D uh, vision job to see how much angular change you're going to have to have over the operating envelope. So, um, typical robot calibration is going to be 3 to 5x the repeatability. If you have a full robot calibration, and this is one of those techniques I was mentioning earlier, where we can identify the true as-built parameters of the manipulator and use that information to improve our accuracy. At the end of the day, the robot's inaccuracy came, uh, comes from largely the differences between the software model that the kinematics are running in the robot's uh, algorithms versus the true as-built parameters of the physical arm. Um, the nominal model may have an upper link that's exactly 900, meter, no, 900 millimeters long, when in fact the as-built one is 899.5. That difference shows up as inaccuracy. But when we do a full robot calibration, we can identify those differences and use that information in our model to improve the accuracy. So uh, you notice your repeatability, your typical accuracy, and your payload reach and speed for a range of robots here. This typical accuracy is what we use as part of our calculator to judge the fitness of the application. And with that, um, Hob will continue to discuss the applications. Uh, thanks a lot, Eric. I appreciate that. So now, um, at this point, what we've been able to do is um, put all the pieces together. So we've talked about vision. We've talked about robotics. We've talked about calibration, um, the vision to the robot, so forth. And so um, today we are announcing the um, 3D Made Easy calculator. You can see the URL uh, up there, universalrobotics.com slash calc. It will be launching in exactly a week. Uh, there's a countdown there. You can poke your email in there and we'll let you know when it's live. It will be uh, no charge. It's an engineering design tool uh, that you can use as much as you want. So, um, But this will kind of give you an idea of what you'll need to put in there. So on the left, if you look over on the left where it says input, um, you'll need to put in some information around the work envelope of the robot. So as we already discussed, you'll need to put in the surface type, like is it flat or is it a bin. You'll need to give us the dimensions of the work envelope. So like if you're um, looking at a pallet, um, you know, a 48 by 40 pallet, it would be like 1.2 meters by 1.1 meters, and it might be a meter high. Um, so that would be, for instance. Um, and then we interactively give you feedback on that. Uh, the object itself, you'd be putting in um, whether it's a complex, irregular object or, or if it's a rectangular, box-like object, whether it's small or large, doesn't matter. And then the uh, overall dimensions of that part. And then um, uh, we will be giving you an opportunity in an expert mode where you can actually select your own camera. We give you what, I, what we have done is gone out and selected a lot of the typical sensor types out on the marketplace um, so that you could kind of choose exactly what you want. Or you can let us uh, kind of select one for you. And you'll notice down in the bottom, in this case, um, I've actually given you the elements of accuracy that we've talked about up to this point. 3D vision accuracy, the hand-eye accuracy, that's between the robot and cameras, and then the tool control point, which would be between the tool that is actually like the, uh, if you have a set of vacuum uh, or a gripper or something like that between the robot and, and that uh, gripper. And then the robot accuracy that Eric just talked about, when you add that together, you get your total system accuracy that you can expect. So the other thing I just briefly wanted to touch on, and, and any time you do this, there's like 100 and exceptions, but I kind of wanted to give you a rough idea of a scalable vision system that there 
um, depending on that geometry and the accuracy needs, um, you can kind of see here um, the working distance from the camera to object. And so please don't use this to design a system, but I'm just trying to give you a gut feel of the types uh, of things that you could do. If you're within uh, 0.3 to 0.5 meters, a meter or two meters, so forth, uh, if you have medium-sized parts or boxes in a certain workspace, or, or you have larger boxes and so forth, uh, the types of cameras you might need. And so in general, at least in universal robotics, we try to use uh, uh, the simplest camera possible for the job. And so you can see uh, we start with USB 2, and in some cases even add a second one on another host card. Um, to, and, and to keep it simple, and then if necessary, we kick it up to Giggy, so we give you kind of a feel of the types of uh, cameras that might work for various situations. So we kind of worked our way through elements of accuracy, how you position the cameras, um, all those different things stack up. Um, so now let's go to uh, choosing a 3D uh, vision system. So what, what I'd like to zero in on for a moment would be kind of like, well, what's the sweet spot for the lowest cost 3D vision? Because cameras alone can, can uh, uh, cost thousands of dollars very quickly. Um, so I've tried to give you some attributes that if you uh, fit these uh, questions, that you can have a fairly low cost vision system. So if the robot operating envelope is typically um, less than a meter and a half cubed, um, then um, you don't need as high a camera optics. If the cameras, if, if your physical space allows cameras to be mounted up to another meter beyond the workspace as needed, um, then, then that will allow you freedom to choose a variety of cameras. Uh, for the robot, if you're picking the parts or the box up with vacuum or grippers, uh, then, then uh, that kind of sets about a three millimeter accuracy, um, um, which allows you a little more freedom in your 3D vision system. If the uh, part or box to Eric's point is under uh, 50 kilograms, give or take, that means the robot can be smaller, your accuracy goes up. And then um, if the speed um, is just generally now, we're talking entire system throughput. Um, give or take here, and again, you have to design for each situation, but if you're not doing more than 10 parts or boxes a minute for the whole system movement, of which a piece of that is your vision, um, then typically you can probably get away with USB 2 cameras, which drops your cost significantly. So the parts and the boxes, um, if the part has a visible edge or boundary, then you can do shape matching. And as you might recall from earlier, is that shape matching does a little bit better in lower lighting, so you don't need custom lighting, and it can handle a wide variety of shapes. So I'll give you an example. Um, if you have a white egg on a black background, um, you, you'd be able to see that, even though it doesn't have a physical edge, it has a visual edge because you can see, uh, see that well. Typically, if your reflectivity uh, gets too high, it's hard for shape matching. Uh, what would not work for shape matching well is if you had like a automotive, uh, a dull molded black part with a black background. It'd be very difficult for a shape matching system to pick it up. Um, uh, for shape matching, a lot of times uh, they will use a CAD model. So if you have a CAD model, that also reduces cost. Doesn't mean you can't do it in other ways uh, by generating a 3D point cloud and feeding that into the system, which you can, but it just requires more engineering typically. And then typically if you're only doing one part, um, that lowers the cost. Uh, if you're doing multiple parts, there's typically additional engineering required to between shifting between parts. So if you put all that together and say, okay, what's the low low end of my 3D robotic system? Um, this kind of this next slide kind of gives you a rough idea of trying to use standard off-the-shelf components as much as possible to meet that previous list I just went over. So you can see 2D vision back in the mid '80s was in the 60k range, and it has come down under 10k now. You know, five to eight. Hey, you can get a 2D system uh, that's quite nice, actually. 
Uh, 3D really started to come on in the mid-90s in the above 50 range, and typically now you'll spend about 20K. Uh, depends, obviously, if you're doing precision um, um, part inspection, it would be higher. Um, but those previous low-cost attributes can get you down around the 10K per, uh, range. So let me just kind of go over some of these options again and to kind of summarize. Um, you actually can, um, depending on whether you're doing precision part inspection, general machine vision, random part picking, whatever, um, you can see the accuracy at the very bottom. Uh, if you need like in a one to five millimeter accuracy, um, you could probably go to the first two columns. If you need, uh, if you're doing more part inspection and precise part picking, where the camera might be on the robot, where you need in the sub millimeter range, uh, then you probably need, then your price is probably going to be in the 20, 30k range. Okay, and so that allows you um, a chance to take a look at, at different kinds of options that are available to you. And by the way, these slides will be as a PDF um, um, out on the Universal Robotics website at the universalrobotics.com slash cal to be able to pick these slides up. All right, so the key benefits around a robotic 3D vision system is one, if you absolutely have a 3D object that you need to locate in 3D space, Remember we talked about you actually, it is random enough that every time you need to not only identify, identify XYZ, but you need to identify that orientation around XYZ because it varies each time, uh, then you need 3D to do that. Um, so, and shape matching um, as a methodology uh, works well for identifying complex objects and uh, varying lighting conditions and it's particularly good at, at identifying partially hidden objects when they're stacked and you're only able to see uh, parts of the uh, object or part. Um, another key thing is uh, choosing the right cameras that you need for the job. And remember that, that your picking uh, technique will impact your vision requirements. And, of course, uh, we have a product through Moto. Motoman uh, at the at the 10K price point for the simple case that we mentioned earlier. So, in summary, what I'd like to do is uh, do this, and then we're going to move over to a Q&A time. Uh, robotic 3D vision summary. So, use 3D where part complexity, location random, randomness, or motion required, whether it be vision guidance or part inspection. So motion comes in, so for instance, if um, if you're trying to, in the past, what you've done is you've actually screwed apart to, to a main body of something else, but it's always been stationary in a jig, um, you wouldn't need 3D. But what if you said, I want to I want to screw that thing in as it's moving down the production line uh, to speed up the process, that motion introduces randomness where you would need to do 3D. 3D is the mainstream solution, but it does require choosing the right tool for the job. So if you don't need 3D, use 2.5D. If you don't need 2.5D, go to 2D, because um, uh, each step down reduces your overall uh, overall cost in most cases. As we show, I showed you uh, examples, and Eric did, that the Motoman robots uh, are some of the most accurate robots in the world. Uh, they have a wide range. And then um, the Universal Robotics 3D Made Easy Calculator, you can go out to the um, URL that's indicated there and uh, use it online as much as you'd like. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our experts, uh, Greg and Adika. We've had numerous questions that have come in, and I think it would be great to take some of those, field some of those questions and answer them. Okay, we have one question that uh, came up. Uh, the, the question is, are fixed mount cameras better, uh, or what's the difference between fixed mount cameras and uh, robot mounted cameras? Uh, 
there are different, every application has its uh, uniquenesses. Uh, fixed mouth cameras are very good in applications where product is coming into a robot that uh, needs to be picked up and placed in other locations. That means cycle time. Uh, we can parallel process and do uh, vision processing while the robot is moving our parts to another location. So that is one reason that a, a fixed mount camera would work very well. Arm mounted cameras also have their, their place in applications that have a number of different locations that uh, need to use vision so the robot can carry the camera on its end detector and uh, locate parts in varying or different locations within a, a cell. So they, they do, both uh, application instances have their place. Uh, with an automatic camera, you, you don't have to replicate the number of uh, components within a cell as to having uh, multiple cameras above uh, locations that parts are coming in, so you, can, you don't have to replicate the hardware. But it also means that you have to move to a location and take the picture when the camera is on the robot, it may require you to stop or move at a slower speed to take that image. So that may cost you just a little bit of time or cycle time in that case. One more question uh, that we received is, how do the different part matching techniques affect accuracy? The two part matching techniques that we've spoken about is surface-based matching and shape-based matching. Shape-based matching is basically looking for edges, and um, it has a pre-trained um, um, models of how your part is actually going to look like uh, at different scales and different distances and different orientations. Uh, the shape-based matching actually uh, allows you uh, to have the weightability that's desired in a random application. Uh, the accuracy is going to be affected by the model finding and how much uh, variation in the distances uh, is required, whereas surface-based matching is actually looking for point cloud and but does not actually um, allow you to scale the models to the extent that's required. Uh, but if uh, your workspace is limited, the surface-based matching is going to be uh, more accurate than shape-based matching. Okay. Another question that uh, has come across is uh, the difference between uh, uh, repeatability and, and precision. Well, actually, uh, uh, the question is, robot precision and accuracy are different, uh, are accuracy uh, linked with precision of a robot, okay? Let me explain again. It's, it's accuracy and precision. They are very similar in in nature, but uh, the definition is much different. Precision is very close to what repeatability is. Repeatability is very precise uh, of a robot. Robots can go back to exactly the same point very, very close to each other. Accuracy and precision are not necessarily related uh, very tightly because uh, I can have a very uh, precise robot. It goes back to exactly the same place every time, but the accuracy of, of moving to a point in space that the robot has never been before may not be the, the same uh, area. If so, I may? Go uh, ahead. This is Eric. Um, yes, uh, what Greg is saying is true, and this is the reason that we try not to use the term precision, because precision sounds like both things, repeatability and accuracy. Repeatability we can understand as its own thing. Can the robot repeat, go back to the place it was sent to the first time? And accuracy, then we can build a definition around that based on uh, uh, being able to achieve a position that it has not gone to previously. Precision is not a term. We try, we try not to use that term in this industry because it just serves to add to, uh, to this confusion. So, as a rule, when people say precision, they mean repeatability. 
And that's the point that Greg is making here. Um, in fact, in our business, we see this a lot. People will ask the question, after having seen a robot taught by hand with a teach pendant doing some operation, they'll say, wow, how accurate is that robot? in their amazement, and we will answer, that robot is repeatable to within a tenth of a millimeter. Did we answer the question he asked? No. Did he know the question he was asking? No. All right? So it is best if we avoid precision and use repeatability and accuracy for clarity's sake. Another question that has come up is those can these camera systems measure on the fly as the robot is in motion as a, in a robotic, uh, robotically uh, dispensing or, or some application. And in, in a 3D environment, uh, the camera system that Universal Robotics is, is using is Six mount cameras, so the robot can be moving uh, while it is taking those images. It can be taking those images uh, while the robot is doing just another task, or just as long as it's not in the way of the cameras. In an application where the robot is holding the, the camera, uh, there is also the possibility of taking images while the robot is moving. There is a number of things that you have to take into consideration. If I'm moving at an extremely high speed, uh, the time or the exposure time of that camera has to be very small to be able to take that image without blurring the image and things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of things to consider when you're doing an application with a robot actually moving while it is being held by the, the robot or the camera being held by the robot. So exposure time, so typically you want, to, you want that exposure time to be very low, so you want to have a lot of light in the area that the robot is trying to uh, take a picture of, a, of an object or an item. Okay, one more question. How is the camera reference frame calibrated to the robot user frame? Uh, Chin system goes to a robot view of camera uh, calibration using a checkerboard pattern, and that's how uh, we determine the transformations between the camera reference frame and uh, the base coordinate frame of the robot. All taking uh, 15 images of the calibrated uh, turn at uh, different positions, and the transformation is uh, then computed. A question on uh, what is an example of 2.5D vision. Uh, we have, uh, you know, other more uh, uh, 2D type of cameras that are, are available that when you're taking that image, you're looking at X, Y, and rotation in Z. That is uh, a 2D, uh, you know, a flat plane. The addition of, of using... Uh, information from the camera that, that would measure the part is an example of using 2.5D to get that depth, that Z depth as part of the, the information. Uh, so 2.5D may be using a, a separate device like a laser sensor that would give us the depth. Uh, that can consi be considered 2.5D. If you're doing it as uh, a grayscale type of image and, and saying that that's 2.5D, then you may be doing calculation to get that half uh, of, of uh, dimension, which is maybe the depth. So you have X, Y, Z in, uh, in a calculated value as opposed to the, along with the rotation of the part. So a good example of that, uh, great to follow on, would be uh, a good application would be where you have a flat surface or a production line or a jig, and it's merely, it knows it has five parts it deals with, and they're, they're known different depths or whatever, um, but it's a stamp part or a relatively flat part. That would be a great use of 2.5D, right? Right. There's a specific uh, question on uh, how, how can you calibrate a motor band robot better than motor cow uh, using vision or not? And we have, uh, using better uh, 
measurement tools like laser interferometers and, and things like that, uh, we can calibrate the robot very precisely uh, or very well uh, in many respects. Is it using the same algorithms and the same calculations that MotorCal is using? Yes. Uh, typically, MotorCal uh, is using a string encoder. That is the baseline type of an operating method. But uh, we do have uh, laser uh, measurement devices that we can measure that uh, displacement very accurately. And the better measurement tools that you use, the more accurate that your robot is going to be because it has better information to calculate from. That's right. Um, the math doesn't change. Uh, the filtering method and the algorithms uh, will achieve better accuracy insofar as you're able to uh, better determine the true as-built values of the manipulator. So um, that's a question of metrology. A string encoder has its limitations. A uh, uh, laser tracker is much better. So uh, depending on the final accuracy that you are trying to achieve, you pick the uh, measuring stick appropriately. Uh, there's a question that came uh, across to you that uh, will you discuss the physical and, and software integration of the cameras uh, to the robot in this session? Uh, we don't have time, but we will try to address many of these questions that we can. With eight minutes left in, or seven minutes left in, in the session, we'll try to answer a few more of these questions before the end of our time, but we will take these offline and try to get you some answers uh, back for your questions that are on our list. So to go on with, uh, with a, another uh, question, uh, the physical and software integration, we will, we will send you some information about that, but uh, we do have uh, interconnection between uh, 2D cameras and, and uh, these 3D uh, systems are uh, typically through Ethernet to an embedded uh, PC or uh, a processor that is, is actually doing a 3D calculation. Um, that in, in the integration, there are, there are commands in the robot controller that we can implement that uh, uh, can get that information in and out very quickly. So, uh, Dick here, Greg, uh, there's a question that uh, on some basic terms that I think would help all of us. Can you guys describe the following terms mean pose, irregular object, and 3D point cloud? I would love to do that. That's, uh, Pose is going to be an angle. It, it literally is the tool angle is, is pose or position angle of the part relative to the camera. Pose uh, position is X, Y, Z, so it, that's going to be a translational value. And pose is going to be the angle that that uh, resting angle that the part would be in. The regular object is you have normal objects like cube, rectangles, squares, circles, those types of things. The regular objects are many of the other types of objects like a mouse or, uh, or some other item that you're going to be picked up, picking up. It's more irregular in shape. It's not one of the, you know, uh, square rectangles and triangles and, and the, the baseline basic shapes. I would also like to add that more features are, uh, you know, more features on the surface of the object as well. Right. So the last one is a wait, oh yeah, the three D point cloud guys. The three D point cloud is one that uh, it, it, when doing a, a image of a part. Now three D point cloud in this particular case, in, in the, the ones that we've shown today, we are not doing necessarily a three D point cloud. Some measurements, some three D camera systems are actually uh, creating a three D point cloud, very much like a three D CAD cam type of system would be creating uh, out of the park. So every one of the points that it's, it's finding is a point on the surface. And it creates a 3D point cloud in a CAD CAM type of uh, uh, tool that uh, it, it's called a 3D point cloud. So uh, you can make uh, any IR sensor that actually gives you a dense, uh, dense uh, point cloud, which is dense points on the surface uh, surface of an object. What we're doing is accumulating all the points that a vision system or, um, you know, an IR system can actually see and accumulating as, 
XYZ points, uh, and that is what a point cloud is. Yeah, so there's uh, one question I want to get in here because I think it's important that it talks about the limits of vision in general. It says, uh, what if you're uh, faced with part image conditions and a poor edge features and not much texture? Is that time to use different techniques? And one comment I'd have, and then I'll turn it over to you guys, would be uh, we had to limit this uh, webinar to not discussing structured light uh, laser and other approaches that might give you uh, robust information in, in other situations. But guys, just comment on this if you would. So what do you do when uh, you can't really get edge, you can't get features, you don't have much texture? What, what other kind of techniques are, are available? Well, there, there are a, a number of different different possibilities. Really, in most of these applications, we need some features. You need you need something to to be able to find an edge, uh, uh, you know, a circle, a square, something that that is on the part that that gives us some type of feature. On featureless items, uh, then we may you know turn to a laser line or trying to throw a structured light on an object to try to give us that edge or that, that reference point that we're trying to find. Uh, but many different applications have, you know, varying requirements and a formless type of object is very difficult to, to handle. But uh, there are techniques where we can find, you know, shadows and spaces and, and there's a lot of things that we can do with even 2D vision or, you know, even a 3D type of picture that uh, may help us out. We may throw some lighting or uh, do some, some techniques like that to enhance an edge or a feature of the part. I, I would like to say, I mean, uh, the structured light illumination uh, the systems available that actually project textures, specific textures uh, on the object uh, that might be useful to actually uh, get the granularity for, uh, if you don't need a point cloud, for example, for periopsis. So there are possible uh, and available uh, commercially offers of available centers to actually uh, do that kind of elimination. Hey guys, I think we're done. And Jeff? Hello? Hello Jeff. Oh, okay, so we are ready to finish up. All right. So, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much. So, I'm just going to turn it over to you for any last minute closing comments or any instructions you want to give. Uh, yeah, just a couple of comments. If you fill out, uh, there should be a little poll off on the right. Just tell us, was this useful, yes or no? And specifically, if there are other things you'd like us to uh, talk about in the coming months, um, kind of as like an engineering series on... Um, what the hot buttons are, uh, we'd be glad to continue doing this, but we need to hear from you. And then uh, finally, if you need, uh, if you'd like to play with the calculator, it'll be available in a week as long as, as well as the PDF uh, file of this, universalrobotics.com slash calc, E-A-L-C. Uh, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This does bring us to the conclusion of our call.